As you might have guessed from my content, I love old devices. Whether it's an old MacBook, an iPod, or perhaps an iPhone, I love to see the old equipment still working. And even though one reason is just being a collector and pursuing the retro nostalgia feeling, there are other sentiments why I like to keep old devices working. I feel that consumerism causes unnecessary waste, not only in ecological or resources sense of the word, but I feel that the way how our computing resources are utilized now is lazy or greedy in a certain way. Lazy in terms of how much computing power we now need to do essentially the same things we did 10 years ago. We're still busy doing primarily the same things, whether it's on our computers or phones, we chat, look at media or video, send emails, uh, fill out documents and spreadsheets. And the nature of these thing, things didn't change yet, but for some reason we now use exponentially more powerful devices and our old ones, which were entirely capable back in the day, are becoming obsolete. And then brings me to the next topic, which is planned obsolescence. For giant tech companies like Apple, Microsoft, Google, planned obsolescence is essential for the, their business strategy. Apple, for example, nowadays uh, prevents you from upgrading your devices. They sold their battery uh, memory storage to the motherboard of the laptop, um, uh, same as with an iPhone, so that instead of repairing or buying a new battery, you'd have to buy a new device altogether. And the same goes for software. You're generally locked out from newer updates of iOS or macOS after some time for the same reason. I covered the topic of operating system in my earlier video where the old 2009 MacBook was stuck on High Sierra version of macOS that did not receive security updates for a while. And when it comes to an old iPhone, you're totally out of luck since you won't be able to insta install side applications on it or other operating system. But in case of an old MacBook, if you're determined to still use it for whatever reason, uh, there is still a way to fully use the device with all its capabilities by installing Linux on it. And fortunately, I have an old MacBook Air around and in this video, I will do exactly that. Try out three Linux distros and see how it goes and give you my perspective. So what I have right here is a box with an old MacBook Air from year 2011. This is 13 inch aluminum unibody model with dual core Intel i5 processor of 1.7 gigahertz. It has four gigabytes of RAM and 128 gigabytes of solid state disk storage, which Apple called flash storage back then. It also has Intel HD 3000 graphics processor with 384 megabytes of VRAM. And it has an SD card reader on the side two USB 2 ports and one Thunderbolt slash mini display port on the side. It was not a very powerful device when it was released and unfortunately it belongs to a generation of MacBooks with more limited repairability than previous ones. You can't replace RAM memory here. It is also a bit harder to replace the hard drive or battery, albeit not impossible and you can see those articles on iFixit. This particular laptop still works fine so I'm not going to replace anything inside it. However, it still runs High Sierra. It doesn't have latest security updates. You can't install most of the modern applications on it. So it's only useful for some retro computing aesthetic. But wouldn't it be nice if it still be useful, right? So to investigate, I decided to try three Linux distros, Linux Mint, Ubuntu, and Elementary OS. Linux Mint, and Ubuntu are very famous Linux distributions. Uh, I'm going to use Mate version of Linux Mint as it is more lightweight than the default Cinnamon desktop environment. For Ubuntu, I was thinking of trying out a lighter variant, for example, Xubuntu. However, for the sake of comparison and keeping this video interesting, I'm going to just try the default distro and see how it will hold on this uh, old piece of hardware. Finally, Elementary OS is a relatively unknown Linux distribution Yet it is mentioned many times online as it visually closest to the normal Mac OS as far as the Linux distros go. Hence I thought it's only fair to include it in the comparison. 
I'm going to compare how well they fit this old 2011 MacBook Air based on the following criteria. First is ease of installation. That is how pleasant and flawless the experience of installing a particular distro on this MacBook Air would be. Second category is out of box experience. That is how good is the default distro, how well it works, whether you need to configure or install anything extra, for example, audio or Bluetooth drivers, um, and also whether you're able to do some basic actions, that is using a browser, uh, writing text documents, saving images, and listening to music. Third category would be available applications, which is similar to out-of-box experience one, but it will cover mostly the default selection of applications for a particular distro and how wide and useful it is for a particular Linux distro. Uh, finally, the final category will be the overall performance, and this is generally how fast and quick does this Linux work on the particular MacBook Air that we're looking at. Additionally, just to have some kind of objective measurement here, instead of my subjective opinion, I'll run Geekbench 5 on all the operating systems, and just for extra fun, also on the old 2009 MacBook, and my own MacBook Pro M2 Max that I'm using right now for my day-to-day -day work. So, the first step, creating an installation media. For the installation, I'm going to use three USB sticks. One for each distro. And by the way, uh, all distros have very low system requirements that fully, well, with an exception of Ubuntu perhaps, certify the technical specifications of our MacBook. The websites of the distros list all the needed information for you to create a USB stick and install Linux on the device. But just for general information, I'm going to outline the bulletproof method here. Once you downloaded your ISO files, you need to go and download a software called Etcher. A link to it, for example, is available on Linux Mint installation tutorial page. Etcher is a very simple program which asks you to select the ISO you want to flash, the USB stick where to put it, and it then does all the work for you. After about an hour, all the USB sticks are ready for installation of Linux distros on the MacBook Air. So now it's time for me to go through the rating criteria that I outlined earlier and explain how I experienced the whole process and the result. We start with ease of installation. All of the Linux distros were super easy to install. You had to plug in the USB stick into your MacBook and press Option when it would start up. Then select the EFI boot uh, option, and then you would see the grub menu uh, that is the default for the Linux distros uh, that allowed you to start the live image. Now, something about live images Linux Mint's live image is always a full Linux distro that allows you to try out the distro functionality before committing to installing it, and then you just install it from the distro itself. While Ubuntu and Elementary gave me an option to jump straight into the installation, which was a nice option for a change, in case you already know what to expect. During the installation, you can select to either use your full hard drive or partition only part of it, in case if you still want to dual boot. Myself, I chose just to use the full 128 GB disk. And you can still continue to use the live image during the installation if you want, for example, to browse internet. Um, Otherwise, you can read about the features and perks of a particular Linux distro in the installation of wizard. Um, that is a very nice touch, so it sort of keeps you occupied compared, for example, to Windows installation process. With all the distros, after the installation, I had to reinstall the YN Bluetooth driver, even though it was working by default, so not sure about that one. Um, and additionally, Ubuntu offered to already install all the updates during the installation process, which was a nice touch, while Elementary and Mint had to run OS updates after the first boot. So in total for the score, Ubuntu scores 5 out of 5, Elementary scores 5 out of 5, and Linux Mint scores 4 out of 5. Maybe it's a little bit unfair, but I felt that the option to just jump straight in the installation was a really nice addition uh, from Ubuntu and Elementary. For out-of-box experience, all the basic functionality worked perfectly for all the distros. That includes keyboard lightning, volume controls, functional keys, drivers, sound and camera. If we go about the specifics per distro, there are some minor differences. For Linux Mint, 
with regards to default behavior of the apps, I encountered some issues with Firefox not playing YouTube videos smoothly by default. Finding a fix for this proved to be a, a bit more challenging than anticipated, slightly tarnishing on the out-of-box experience. A less technical person would not be able to do so by themselves and fix it. Ubuntu gave me a similar experience as Linux Mint, including Firefox, but also there was a minor fact that by default it was not very easy to drag and drop files from Ubuntu File Manager to a connected network drive. I used the network drive to copy-paste the screen recordings over and I did not have this experience in Mint and was surprised to see it in Ubuntu like this considering the fact that Mint is based on Ubuntu. Now for elementary OS, as I said, basic functionality worked fine, however there were similar problems with the network server as with Ubuntu and the default browser didn't work. In fact, Elementary was the most hostile in terms of available applications by default and amount of settings in distro. Perhaps being less elementary in some regards would have been better for this particular Linux distribution. And I will cover the amount of apps in Elementary in the next section. As for the scoring, the out-of-box experience, Ubuntu gets 4 out of 5, Elementary 3 out of 5, and Linux Mint gets 4.5 out of 5 due to the problem with the Firefox that is present by default. When it comes to available applications, the selection of applications available on Linux Mint was perfect for my needs. The distro already comes packed with all the essential applications right out of the box. This includes office applications, some simple games, image and video viewer, a musical player, obviously mail and web browser, which is Firefox applications, and many more. In fact, if you don't want the particular application that you are very much used to, for example, a Chrome browser, the default application set in Mint gives you everything you need already. Ubuntu scores the same as Mint, also offering a comprehensive selection of applications, perhaps a bit slightly different from Mint, but working nonetheless, ensuring that you have everything you need. Finally, for elementary OS, the selection of applications is quite minimal. I found myself needing to install many additional applications and also the settings options in the settings apps are quite limited. Uh, for example, installing Firefox would have been a problem for less technical person because you had to install it through terminal and the default browser had trouble with displaying anything at all. So the default browser was just not working for me. And that is somewhat a deal breaker when it comes to the applications. You at least want to have one working browser uh, when you install a new distro and elementary OS is one didn't work. So when it comes to scoring on available applications category, Ubuntu and Linux Mint get five out of five and elementary OS sadly gets two out of five. Now on to the final category, the overall performance. Well, the performance of Linux Mint on MacBook Air was a breath of fresh air. Throughout the usage of it, it was very stable and pleasant. It really felt that Linux Mint managed to breathe new life into the old hardware without any significant slowdowns. I was able to do most of my normal tasks effortlessly and fast. While Ubuntu was generally reliable, I noticed that it could be a bit slow at times, especially when compared to Mint's performance. This is of course in line with the fact that system requirements listed were above capability for this MacBook Air, so no surprises here. I have to say that Ubuntu was still pretty much usable and you could still enjoy it if you are willing to stick to some occasional sluggishness. Otherwise, you can always go and try and install Xubuntu. Now, elementary OS mirrored Ubuntu in terms of performance. It was functional and certainly made the MacBook Air more usable, but there were moments of sluggishness that were noticeable. So in the end, if we talk about the perceived score of how I perceived it while using it, uh, the score would be Ubuntu 4 out of 5, Elementary 4 out of 5 and Linux Mint 5 out of 5. Linux Mint performance here was just perfect. Now on to the Geekbench results. To quantify the performance observation, I ran Geekbench 5 on each operating system. I also included results from the old 
2009 MacBook and my MacBook Pro M2 Max for comparative perspective. I did not expect major differences across the operating systems since it's the same set of tasks that Geekbench runs on the CPU, which stayed the same. However, I wondered if some differences were there due to age of the systems with Linux, uh, Linux operating systems being more modern than Mac OS High Sierra. Now, as you can see, the M2 Max is overly too powerful compared to the old Intel processor. If we remove it, we can see the comparison between the individual distros a bit clearer. And as far as Geekbench data goes, there isn't much of a comparison. All the scores are more or less the same, which I'd say was expected. All the operating systems, including macOS High Sierra, are very well optimized, so whatever deviations we see in the data, they were mostly due to some background processes. So what can I say in conclusion? To be honest, when I decided to make a video about it, I was a bit skeptical about the end result, given the age of the laptop and the state of modern software. However, in the end, I am very pleasantly surprised. All Linux repositories I tried were easy to install, detected all the hardware, and had relatively smooth performance. For this particular 2011 MacBook Air, Linux Mint Mate is clearly the definite winner. It gives this old laptop a new purpose. It delivers very smooth and responsive performance that is very impressive for such an old device. Next to that, it has great out-of-the-box experience from installation to daily use, everything works seamlessly, requiring minimal setup or additional tweaking, apart for the hiccup with the Firefox, of course. And finally, it has rich selection of applications. It comes equipped with the all essential software, making it ready for immediate use without the need for further downloads. So as my final thoughts, this experience demonstrates that all the laptops like MacBook Air from 2011 don't have to be discarded. With a nice lightweight Linux distro like Linux Mint I tried here, they can serve valuable roles again, be it as a recipe book in your kitchen, a viewer for instructions in your workshop, or a learning device for kids. I'm glad that this experiment is a testament to the idea that technology can have a second life, offering a sustainable alternative to constant upgrades and new purchases. So. Before you think about throwing away your old laptop, consider repurposing it with Linux. It's a practical, eco-friendly choice that might breathe new life into old hardware. And if you have managed to reach this spot, this means the video is almost over. So thank you for watching and I will see you in the next one.